Okay, everyone, it's nine o'clock and welcome to IFM. My name is Nikas Bergrian. Uh, I'm uh, the organizer together with Christian Bjorn School of this policy seminar. On the topic, is the market economy culturally harmful? And uh, Christian and I are running a research project uh, called Cultures of Trust and Institutions of Freedom, financed by the John Templeton Foundation. And it's within the confines of this project that uh, we are arranging this policy seminar. The idea is to sort of summarize and uh, give information a little about, about the ongoing research in the project. Um, so we will present today uh, a couple of studies that we have conducted within this project. One on uh, whether globalization undermines social trust and one on whether the market economy is uh, better for men than for women. Uh, so we will get into those details in a little while. Um, and the product generally takes this kind of uh, interest in quite large questions. How does the market economy affect the culture of a society? Does it undermine important values, traditions, etc., cetera? Uh, or uh, does it rather reinforce and strengthen them? So these are two examples of the research that we are conducting within the project that we talk about today. Uh, so the program is, is such uh, that we have Karin Edmark as our moderator. Kristen and I will present our two studies first. Then we have a distinguished panel. Uh, we have Johanna Möllerström uh, from uh, George Mason University uh, on Zoom. We have Ulrika Fjernström from FURES here, and Karin Swanberg Fröval, who is State Secretary in the Ministry of Culture in Stockholm. Uh, so they will give some comments on uh, Christians and my work. After they are done, and <clears throat> we have sort of talked with them a little bit, uh, the floor will be open for questions from the audience, if you should have any remaining uh, queries. Uh, and though the questions are only for the people here, not for the people on Zoom for practical reasons. I should also mention before I give the word to Karin that uh, we will film this seminar and put out a video on the IFN homepage afterwards for those of you who would like to see us again or maybe spread the word to your friends. Uh, and we will also take some photographs. So by being here, we interpret it such that you accept uh, that you may be part of some photo that we might put on our web page uh, or somewhere else that like reporting about this seminar. With those brief words of welcome, I give the word to our uh, moderator, Karin Edmark from Stockholm University. Okay. And I will be very brief because I think we all want to get started with the discussion of these big and brief issues that we are here to discuss. So I think oftentimes nowadays when you sit in a research seminar, you tend to discuss quite small and technical issues. And sometimes we are criticized for that, for not taking on the broad and big questions. <clears throat> but so this, I think we should really take the opportunity here to discuss these big and really important uh, topics. Uh, so is the market economy culturally harmful? And we will have, uh, you will see, a focus on globalization, social trust, and also capitalism and the potential relation to gender inequality. And uh, again, we welcome the audience here and at Zoom, and we are also happy to have an excellent panel of discussions here to give different perspectives. And I think we should start then by having the researchers whose studies are really the focus of this seminar, the floor. So first, Christian, you will present one of the studies and then Niklas will continue. So please, Christian. Well, well thank you, Karin. Um, first of all, let me apologize for not being in, in Stockholm today. Uh, some of you may know that as a university employee, you don't always pick your own uh, time for teaching, and uh, that for me is three days this week. But um, welcome to my humbler boat in southern Denmark. I'm going to talk about uh, one of our studies that was published last year in the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization 
where we ask whether globalization is bad for culture in a very specific way, we're asking whether globalization is bad for trust. Sorry? And can you speak up a little? Maybe, maybe it's possible here, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I uh, was that better. I've moved the microphone. Yeah, better. Good. Thank you. I'll share my screen now, which I hope works. And then <coughs> there we go. So the paper is called "Does Globalization Suppress Social Trust?" This is actually a very old question. Um, it's been discussed since Marx and Durkheim in the late 19th century. Both believe that a, a market economy and a particular international integration would be harmful for, for culture. So Durkheim talked about the distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. So Gemeinschaft is being together. Gesellschaft is a business society. And he thought that our social ties with each other would be undermined by market integration. But in more recent years, Joseph Stiglitz has argued that globalization subverts democracy and it just enriches an elite. It's a very neo-Marxian claim. Daniel Roderick has claimed more specifically that cultural shocks occur that threaten traditional culture and those cultural shocks occur because of globalization. And people like Naomi Klein basically claim that this is actually engineered, that it's an elite conspiracy. You have the full range uh, of arguments against globalization here, and a lot of them, including those that are sometimes taken up by populist policies and politicians, are about some kind of effect where globalization undermines features of our national cultures that we, that we like. And the one that we know is most important for the economy and for people's well-being too is social trust. It's also the one that really sticks out in the Nordic countries. So you could think of this uh, as, as a way in which globalization creates losers. Globalization creates winners and losers in the short run. And if those losers somehow lose something or become detached from the rest of society, you might have a, a negative effect. It might also create economic uncertainty. It might create cultural exclusion if, if globalization is also Americanization. And it might undermine norms. That's at least a claim. On the other hand, globalization can also lead to social learning. Uh, we can't trade with people without getting to know something about them. There's the argument all the way back to Montesquieu, which we, is called du commerce. So the idea that, that having business relations with each other actually makes us behave more reasonably and in a more honest way. Material benefits might actually make us nicer to each other and more trusting simply because we can afford it. And globalization could undermine bad norms. So the effects on norms might go both ways. From a theoretical point of view, this is really a, a moot question. We can't put a sign on the, on, the, on the theoretical effect. So what we've done in this paper is attack this very large question by simply looking at whether globalization affects trust. And we have this very nasty problem of establishing causality because trust might also affect globalization. So uh, a number of, of papers have shown that people who are more trusting also have a more a stronger belief about the positive effects of economic globalization on their lives. Uh, we also know, for example, that in high trust countries, it affects our comparative advantages. Countries like Denmark and Sweden can actually trade goods with the rest of the world where there are features such as design or quality that can't be just written and monitored in a normal contract. Features where you have to believe that we are delivering the quality, we are delivering the design that we promised. Um, and those features actually give us a competitive edge in global competition. 
Um, so this is actually one of the ways where Nicholas Potrafke, our great friend at Sezifo in Munich, uh, some years ago emphasized that this is a problem in all studies of globalization. So how do we solve that? Well, we use the epidemiological method where we look at migrants. So globalization may actually affect your culture and your trust mostly in what's called the formative years, the period between 15 and 25, where most of your political ideology and your norms and so on, they form. If you then migrate, that's the, I, the trust level you take to the new country. But the new country's level of globalization can't affect your the trust that you took with you from home. So that's the idea. We're looking at a very specific group, migrants, in order to solve a causality problem. And we are, with this method, getting very conservative estimates. So our estimates will be biased towards the negative. Our dependent variable is this. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can, you have to be careful? It's a very well-tested question. Uh, and it's a question where you get massive differences across the world, which is why I brought you the map here. Uh, you can see the differences here. Black areas are the least trusting in Europe, white areas the most trusting. And it's pretty easy to see that the most trusting areas are all in the Nordic countries. We are special. And the, the difference starts right on the Danish-German border. You also see that all of the very low trusting areas in Europe are in formerly communist countries. So we know that. This is just uh, to give you a sense of how large these differences are even in Europe. And those are the differences that we're talking about. We're using the European Social Survey, which is a very large uh, sur survey. If we used all of the 10 waves that are available now, we would have access to about half a million responses. The good thing is that they oversample immigrants. So we have a lot of immigrants. Uh, I think it's about 36,000 in total in our sample that we can exploit. And they are from 200 different countries. Uh, we're using the COF index of globalization, <laughs> which is this big index that captures a number of different uh, aspects. So we usually think of globalization as an economic phenomenon, that we trade internationally and then we invest internationally. But part of it is also that we have contacts, interpersonal contacts internationally, that we share information. If you're using Wikipedia, you're, you are engaging in social globalization because very few people care about where an, a Wikipedia entry is written, as long as it's not written in Russia or China. So there's also a cultural aspect to this. We share culture. And there's, of course, a political aspect that we also share international law, for example. Uh, the COF index is a great way, probably the best way we have, of aggregating all of these aspects of globalization as a whole. So what we find here when we look at globalization with this very particular method that solves our problems is a very small but positive effect. So we haven't in all of our work seen a negative effect. All effects here are small. When we find something, it indicates that elements of globalization actually make people a bit more trusting. So the learning aspects very clearly dominate the bad aspects that most of the critics actually emphasize. Uh, in particular, when you look at the first generation, a lot of this is actually driven by informational and cultural globalization. The fact that we share information 
it's not driven by trade flows. It's driven by information flows of different kinds. And even with the second generation, so migrants' children, we actually see effects of informational globalization. So what we conclude here, what we conclude that all of these uh, arguments that are common uh, among <clears throat> populists around the world and this, unfortunately also among social democrats sometimes, uh, we find no evidence of them. We simply find that if there is anything, it's a positive. But we tend to conclude that, well, we we just find zeros because the, the small positives here are small. They're probably not really that important. So this is one uh, of what I thought was one of the most interesting parts of our project here, where we can both look at something that's very important to our country's social trust, but also speak to a, a very topical uh, political discussion not right now, and actually one that is coming up again in the US presidential elections. So we kind of hope that there are at least some Americans who read this study or watch our policy seminar and learn a bit. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna present the second study that is part of the same project with the same kind of underlying interest in one of the big questions of our time in politics and also to some extent in research. This time we move to gender differences. And the question of this second study is, does capitalism disfavor women? Evidence from life satisfaction. Also joint work with uh, Christian here. So the background to this study is that some feminists are very, very critical of capitalism. This is one example, a distinguished uh, feminist uh, theorist, Nancy Fraser at the New School in New York. And she writes the following. Any feminism aimed at liberating all women must itself be anti-capitalist. Liberal pro-capitalist feminisms can at best empower a small privileged stratum of professional managerial women, while leaving the vast majority vulnerable to abuses of every stripe. And another one, Nicole Ashkoff at the University of Massachusetts, writes, we have the tools to vastly improve the lives of the world's women and all people for that matter. Yet we haven't directed our resources, knowledge and energy toward achieving this goal. Why? Because the goal of capitalism is not to better the world, it is to make a profit. So here there is this sort of opposition in their way of thinking between capitalism or the market economy on the one hand, and the well-being of women. You have to reject capitalism if you want to favor women's life situation. Do they have a point? To some extent, of course. Uh, there are several studies showing that women are treated worse in many of our societies with market economies than men. We're not denying that in any way. Um, also, it may be that women have a different attitude towards certain aspects of the market economy compared to men. There are some studies indicating that. They may, compared to men, value these things a little less, perhaps. Freedom of choice, material benefits, competition, <clears throat> free trade, and the small welfare states. Men tend to like those things a little more, according to quite a few studies. But <clears throat> there are also arguments for why capitalism can perhaps benefit women and one of those who claim that to be the case is the philosopher Anne Cutt at Portland State University. So she thinks there are two arguments for that. She writes like this. First, capitalism promotes innovation. It improves technical, it promotes technical innovation that tends to improve quality and length of life for everyone, but particularly for women. But more importantly, for the feminist defense of capitalism, it promotes social innovation in particular the destruction of harmful patriarchal traditions. Thus, the second defense I will make of capitalism 
is that it opposes tradition fetishism and reduces the oppression of traditional societies that impose hierarchies of gender and caste. So this ties in a little bit with Christian's way of describing the debate about uh, social trust and globalization. So here as well, the idea is that market economies can undermine some harmful norms or traditions by creating new opportunities also for women. So how do, our, how do we come into this debate? Well, we think that previous debates and also to some extent connecting to what Karen said, some research has uh, been, uh, have certain shortcomings. We think especially in the humanities, like the philosophers that were quoted before, their arguments are often quite ideological, theoretical and abstract. But when you go to the social sciences, usually the studies are a little bit empirically narrow and limited. So perhaps you look at say, wages for women and men in a certain industry, of course, very valuable research, but it only touches on one particular aspect of the market economy and well-being. So what we try to do in this paper is to take a little bit of a wider approach. We ask how is economic freedom, which is a measure that we use for capitalism, related to the life satisfaction of women and men. And we use economic freedom, thereby covering broad basic features of the market economy. I will present this measure in more detail in a little while. And by measuring life satisfaction as the outcome, we capture, we think, all or the net effects of the market economy on, on people's lives. Uh, because yes, if there is gender discrimination, this will have a negative effect. But if you have social innovation of the kind that Anne Cudd talks about, you have a positive effect. And the idea of using life satisfaction is sort of, we ask people how they themselves experience their lives, including women. And then all of those factors sort of come into play in their answers. That's the idea. And what we really do in the end in this paper is to compare how economic freedom affects women's life satisfaction relative to men, uh, and to examine whether there is a gender gap disfavoring women in market economies. So how do we measure life satisfaction? Well, just as in the study Christian presented, we use data from the European Social Survey, which is a great European survey. Uh, and as in the previous study, we use immigrants uh, as our sample to avoid the problem of reverse causality. And we use the replies to this question. All things considered, how satisfied, satisfied are you with life as a whole these days, nowadays? Please answer using this card, where zero means extremely dissatisfied and 10 means extremely satisfied. How do we measure capitalism? Again, as I mentioned, we use an index called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. It consists of five areas capturing aspects of capitalism in a society on a scale from zero to 10. And those five areas are limited size of government, how much taxation and so on is there, legal quality, sound money, which is low and stable inflation basically, freedom to trade internationally, which is similar to economic globalization, and then limited regulation, how much intervention in the economy that governments engage in. So as I mentioned, this is on the scale from zero to 10. This index is the average of the five areas and they in turn are based on 42 different variables. So uh, a lot of different aspects of the economy go into these measures. And the values are from the countries of origin for um, immigrant samples for the same reasons Christian talked about uh, because if you were to measure this in the same country where people live, it could be that if you get a positive effect, actually more satisfied people may create more market oriented institutions. But by using the immigrant sample, we try to avoid this methodological problem to make sure the effects that we estimate are in fact uh, going from globalization to life, uh, sorry, market economy to life satisfaction. So here are our results. Uh, the exact figures are not so important, uh, but what we do is in a number of um, exercises, relate economic freedom overall, and then the five different areas, 
to the life satisfaction of both women and men and women and men separately. As with our globalization study, the effects are very small, but always positive. That means the more capitalism you have in a society, the more satisfied people are with their lives. And is it the case that men benefit more than women? That is a little bit what we're looking at. Here, we see the positive effects for economic freedom overall. So capitalism overall is positively related to people's life satisfaction. Uh, interestingly, we only get a statistically significant effect for women, not for men. Size of government doesn't seem to matter at all for how satisfied people are, which is a little interesting because a lot of the political debates are about taxes. Uh, but the tax level doesn't really seem to matter very much for life satisfaction. Uh, what does matter the most, actually, is legal quality. So having a, a, an honest, effective legal system, that is the most important for being satisfied with your life, according to our results. And this holds both for women and men. But not even here. The point estimates are slightly larger all the time for women than for men. Um, also having low and stable inflation is good for women's uh, life satisfaction and also economic globalization, freedom to trade. Regulation is again, not related to life satisfaction according to our study. Here's a way of showing this. So these point estimates are mapped here. So basically the dots show how much life satisfaction changes when the six different indicators of capitalism change by one unit. So the effects are very small, but here what's interesting is when we compare the estimates for women and men, the men are the black dots and the women are the white dots. So we see here, the women are above the men in all cases. However, this is called a confidence interval. It's always the case that the women's estimates are within the range of these confidence intervals of the male estimates. It's a little bit technical, but what it means is basically that we cannot say that women actually do better than men because there is insecurity in the data. What we can say is that there is no indication that women fare worse than men. They seem to fare around the same way in market economies in terms of their own life satisfaction. That's the main point of this graph here. And we see again that the most important area uh, is uh, legal quality, that aspect of uh, a market economy. However, looking at immigrants, maybe people say, maybe they're a little bit special. How about uh, Europeans who are natives in their various countries? So we also, keeping in mind that this may reveal reverse causality, we think that chances are a little smaller because we showed that for the other sample, that is not the problem. So probably perhaps not here either. But to illustrate also for the non-immigrant Europeans, we do the same study again. And basically the results are very similar. Uh, you see here women and men, almost identical effects of economic freedom and the various areas of capitalism on life satisfaction. <laughs> and certainly within these insecurity intervals. So we cannot say that men or women do better or worse. They seem to do uh, equally well or be equally satisfied by the market economy, you could say. The effects are a little larger here, like almost twice as large here uh, than for the immigrant sample. And I think it's for the same reason that Christian touched upon. He said we had conservative estimates. Uh, and that's because in that sample, we locate the market economy when people were quite young, their formative years before they migrated to the new countries in Europe. Here we look sort of this at the same time, so the effect should be a little stronger. And this is indeed what we find as well. Uh, so to conclude this study as well, we began by noting the hostility of some feminist uh, scholars towards capitalism. Uh, we think our findings indicate that capitalism, especially legal quality, is beneficial for both women and men, uh, and as, at least as beneficial for women as it is for men. However, 
uh, we cannot say that it's more beneficial to women uh, than to men. But basically no differences in this regard. Uh, but we do recognize that, of course, th with these big questions, in market economies, there are, of course, things that could be improved. This doesn't mean that everything is fine and dandy. Quite the opposite. We know that there are specific problems in many areas. Uh, we're just saying, even with those things taken into account, there are also benefits seemingly such that both women and men on net derive life satisfaction from more economic freedom, from more capitalism. Uh, if one were to rectify the problems of gender discrimination and so on that we do know exists, probably the effects would become stronger. Uh, they are quite small in size as mentioned. Yeah, so this was the second study. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Niklas. And now it's time to hear from the panelists. So we will invite those who are present in the room up to take your place at the table, please. So we have, if you can, uh, there we will hear from Johanna Mullerstörum, Professor of Economics at George Mason University. And Johanna is with us here over Zoom. And then we will also hear from Ulrika Schenström again, CEO of Fores, and from Karin Svonborg Sjöval, State Secretary to the Minister for Culture. And you will get approximately seven minutes each to speak, and you, we will let you present your views in turn. We'll start with Johanna, then move on to Ulrika and to Karin. And then after that, we will let Christian and then Nikla respond to the comments. And after that, we invite the audience present in the room um, to the discussion. So please, Johanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's double check volume and all of that first before I even get started. So, so oh. all of that okay? Yes, we can hear you well. Wonderful. Um, good morning, everyone. I am also sad not to be with you in Stockholm, uh, not only, but partly because it would then have been uh, 9.30 a.m. instead of 3.30 a.m., which I think is a much more suitable time for this kind of activity. Um, but I'm super happy to be with you. This project is obviously extremely interesting and, and important in lots of ways. And Christian, uh, I promise you that when I go and vote, on Tuesday, November the 5th, uh, in the presidential election, I will definitely keep this uh, seminar in mind, as you suggested, and I will make sure to spread the word. Um, okay, so in my seven minutes, I would love to make um, at least three points. So let's see if I can get to all of all of those. Um, one thing that I think would be interesting to think about is in relation to the study on globalization and social trust uh, is the the uh, the question of the size of the groups that people are interacting with. Um, because one thing that happens when you move from smaller, more local economies into a larger, more globalized one is that the size of the group that you're interacting with is obviously increasing and the heterogeneity of the group that you are interacting with is also it's also uh, increasing. Um, and it's interesting to note that in the, in the experiments that we run in order to study people's economic preferences and behavior, we actually see that both of those things, size of group and increased heterogeneity, are, if anything, um, not so great for, for various kinds of social behavior. So larger groups generally lead to less empathy between the participants. It leads to less altruism um, and it leads to less cooperation, lower cooperation in, in social dilemmas. Um, and I'm not saying this because I believe that, uh, that capitalism um, or globalization has these net effects on, uh, um, on these kinds of behaviors. I, I agree with you, um, both intuitively and, and from my research, that the effects probably go in the positive direction. It is, however, interesting to note that 
if one would look just at the group size uh, and on the heterogeneity that comes from, um, from globalization, one would probably expect a negative effect. So the positive effects that we, that we are seeing uh, on, on social trusts and, and obviously on, on so many other uh, important variables of capitalism and globalization, they come about not thanks to, but despite the fact that globalization also comes with, again, increased group size and increased heterogeneity. So that is a, that is a point that I think is, uh, is, is important to make, that there are features in capitalism and globalization that would clearly point in the other direction, but the benefits are so large that they they manage to overcome uh, this and make a, a result in a net effect that goes in the positive direction. Um, when I read and heard you talk about the um, the study on uh, on gender and its relation to capitalism and more specifically economic freedom. One thing I was intrigued about was your choice to to take this 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 broader view and look at at very general variables. So economic freedom is obviously a variable that is very that is very broad that encompasses capitalism and also globalization, even though that's less discussed in that study. Um, but also lots of other uh, lots of other behaviors, and you do break that down and look into various kinds of freedom and their their effects, which is which is great. Uh, also, the the outcome variable you use uh, in terms of life sat satisfaction is obviously a very broad one. So here, and I think it's admirable to take this this broader perspective, um, and it's certainly worthwhile and not something we do very much in in research. With all that said, I think it's. I think it's interesting to to think about breaking down what capitalism and market economy means. What kind of what what building blocks can we can we find in that? And what do we think about the potential gendered effect of those of those building blocks? Um, one thing that then comes to mind is the fact that capitalism and market economy arguably uh, entails more of of uh, competitiveness and competition than than other economic systems and i'm saying arguably because um i'm sure that that even under uh, a completely opposite uh, system think five year plans in the soviet union i'm sure there was a lot of competition and 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 uh, fights in in ways other than what we would see in a market economy the with that said Many of us and, and many people in research think about one defining uh, characteristic of a market economy and capitalism as, as competition. And we do know that women react differently to mm -hmm. and choose to be in um, competitive environments in a different way than men do. So we know uh, from, again, from experimental studies that women have a higher tendency, for example, to choke under pressure uh, in competitive environments, to not increase their performance under under competitive payment schemes as much as, uh, as men do. We also know that women are less willing to choose to enter competitive contexts than, than men do, and that this has to do with women's lower um, willingness to take risk and women's lower uh, confidence in their own relative abilities. And again, why am I saying this? Uh, I'm not I'm certainly not saying it because I think that the the results of your of your study are are wrong. Again, both my my uh, my intuition and my uh, related related work to the extent that I have any would lead me to expect results in the direction that you're that you're showing but just as with the the globalization and social trust i think it's important to remember that there are features of a market economy for example the the competitive pressure that in many ways probably go against your uh the direction of the finding that you're um that you're documenting and I think it's important to remember that in capitalism and market economy there are various features 
that will have effects that go in, in different directions. And that some of those are so positive um, that they uh, that they dominate and compensate for factors that may be, may be less positive for women, like for example, the, uh, the, uh, the competitive pressure. So that's my second point. And my third point uh, that I will make briefly is that I want to remind everyone that there is, there is uh, again, uh, experimental work, and this is my research field. So that's why I keep coming back to it. Uh, there is very interesting experimental work that breaks down or attempts to break down the concept of, of market economy into, into smaller building blocks and study the effects of those building blocks on, uh, uh, on, on, on various, various behaviors and preferences. Um, I published, uh, together with many others, a study in PNIS uh, last year about competitive pressure and then moral behavior. Do people behave more or less morally uh, when, when competitive pressure uh, increases? There we found found a slight negative effect. Um, there was a pooled study with with close to twenty thousand um, respondents. More in general, and this will be my last point. There seems to be an interesting relation between moral behavior and moral behavior can encompass things like again cooperating in in social dilemmas and uh, behaving potentially more altruistically and somewhat less selfishly in, in certain contexts. Um, there is a relationship between being able to hide behind others um, that can lead to, to less moral behavior and feeling responsible um, for, for one's own actions in certain ways, leading to, to more moral behavior. The research is arguing about whether it is market economy or other other economic systems that lead people to be more or less able to hide behind others and more or less able to to be personally and feel personally responsible for choice for choices um some argue that market economies are great in the sense that you can um that you that you need to that you need to take the consequences of your own actions uh, and be your own um be the owner of your own choices and that this that this that this seems to further more moral behavior others argue that instead since market in, uh, market interactions are sometimes anonymous they are not so great for moral behavior because they can lead you to to be able to hide behind others and other people's actions in in ways that can lead to to less moral behavior so again i think um these studies are are fantastic. The project is is great and highly highly topical and interesting. Um, I think the broader view that the project takes is is extremely interesting and worthwhile. Um, but it also inspires me and hopefully others to start thinking about the building blocks that that um, are part of of market economy, capitalism, and globalization, and think about the effects of those various building blocks on various behaviors and preferences that we that we would like to see more of uh, and to think about what building blocks are the most necessary and the most crucial to see the positive effects that we would like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Thank you. The rest of the seminar so that you're present for the discussion. And we will now give the floor to Ulrike Schiff. Thank you so very much for inviting me here today. And hello, Johanna, it was a while ago. Happy mm -hmm. to see you. Um, I'm so happy that you invited me here. I'm actually uh, Ulrika Schenström, as you know. Uh, I'm CEO of Forest. Uh, and uh, at Forest, we appreciate that IFN, uh, EFN, as I say in Swedish, has conducted these studies. Globalization, social trust, and gender equality are very important issues in today's political environment. Um, defending these values is crucial if we want to maintain an inclusive and democracy society. These subjects are also key areas of our work at Forest every day, every minute, every second actually. Research uh, like this plays a vital role in shaping policy and driving reforms. It is always important to deepen our understanding of how society functions, 
so that voters and decision makers can make informed and well reasoned decisions. Firstly, let's tackle the issue of social trust in the area of globalization. Does globalization diminish social trust? There has clearly been a counter reaction against globalization over the last couple of years, and it is important to acknowledge this fact. But as your research shows, globalization doesn't inherently decrease social trust. In fact, it is often enhanced trust through economic and cultural exchanges. What worries me, as you probably most of in this room know, is that the economy, it's not that the economy is too free or that we are too open towards the world, but rather the current backlashes against these values. The backlash to globalization we are currently seeing in Europe and in the US comes from populist national movements. These groups often act as a catalyst for erosion of social trust by spreading disinformation and encouraging political polarization. And you, most of you know that I'm working with this every day. It is also crucial to recognize the real threats to our global society that come from authoritarian states like Russia and China. These nations engage in imperialist actions and strategic investments aimed at this, establishing the international world order. These regimes have an interest in undermining the public faith in liberal democracy and globalization. Their tactics include spreading disinformation and sowing seeds of distrust towards globalization. These multiple threats against liberal democracy and the international world order should be our primary concern as we navigate the complexities of the globalist world. Next, let's address the question of whether capitalism dis uh, disadvantages women. As your research shows, capitalism does not disadvantage women, but can rather be a force for women's empowerment. Market economies provide opportunities for women to participate in the workforce, start businesses, and achieve economic independence. However, this doesn't discount the ex existing challenges and, and inequalities that women face within capitalist systems. This issue of gender equality has always been close to my heart. Most of you here know that I'm talking about this. There was an OECD outlook for, uh, from uh, 2017 we, um, that I'm always talking about maternal leave. Uh, since I took office at the CEO of Forest, we have released several reports on this subject. And one significant factor contributing to the gender gap in income and wages in the disproportionate uptake of parental leave by women. So to address the inequality income between men and women and to reduce the pension gap, we must get to the core of this issue. The introduction of parental benefit in Sweden in 1974 marked a watershed moment for gender equality. The transition from maternity insurance and parental insurance represented a paradigm shift. Sweden then became the first country in the world to offer paid parental leave to fathers, which then allowed both parents to actually stay home with their children. This represented the first step in Sweden's journey towards gender equality. However, it will take time before we achieve equal uptake. In 74, we took out merely 0.5% of parental benefits. In 2021, men took out 30%. Half a century after the introduction of the gender equality reform, we still haven't achieved an equal distribution. Our report underscore that the unequal distribution of parental benefits correlates with the continuing inequality in unpaid domestic work, part-time employment, and seek childcare. Therefore, the equality, uh, equitable allocation of parental leave is paramount. As such, param uh, parental beneath, um, benefit must be reformed in order to achieve a more equal society. 
Moreover, as we contemplate the future, it's worth considering the shifting dynamics of gender roles. Women are increasingly outperforming men in higher education right now. And this, uh, I see a, a, a large problem here also. What is the role of men in the future? They raise question on how we will need to adapt our education system, labor market, social relationships, and cultural values in order to adapt to these changing circumstances. Instead of viewing this as a zero sum game, we should strive for a more inclusive society that both men and women can thrive. In conclusion, while globalization and capitalism presents challenges, the real threats through stem from authorization regimes and their efforts to undermine trust and stability <coughs> by promoting liberal democracy and inclusivity, and inclusivity, we can navigate the complexities of the globalized world and build a more prosperous and equal, uh, equal, more equal future for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and also thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I would like to begin by applauding you both uh, for taking the approach that you've had in these two subjects. I think sometimes um, economics can uh, become so interested in details um, that you, large, sort of, you lose the larger picture. And I think actually having the courage to discuss um, sort of the system as such in moral terms is something that I, I, I applaud and that I wish that I could see more often. So congratulations on that. Um, I will be quite general in my comments. I would not um, have that much to say about methodology or so forth, but, but rather um, perhaps reflect a bit on, on the way that you've gone about <clears throat> this, this research. Um, I sort of read both of your studies a bit as trying to use capitalism and the market economy and globalization as a stress test on values that I think that most of us realize are central to a just society, but also instrumental in building a just society. Those would being both equal rights between men and women and higher levels or high levels of social trust. Um, and I hereby also in a way uh, look at capitalism and globalization almost as synonyms. <laughs> so I should probably have that from the beginning. And I think if you look at your results, um, I think there is, there is proof of resilience um, that sometimes are not noted in the general debate, which can be a bit alarmist. Um, your evidence, even though the results aren't uh, all that dramatic, suggests that uh, sort of the preconceived notion that I think a lot of people in this room have that capitalism is something that fosters good behavior, a collaborative spirit rather than vice versa is, is being confirmed. And also that um, capitalism isn't something that puts women at a general disadvantage to men. The fact that the evidence that you provide is not dramatic or even that strong, I think really is an interesting result in itself <laughs> and one that should be noted uh, because there is so much fear today. Uh, there is so much fear when we discuss uh, the backlash against feminism. There is so much fear when we discuss the backlash against globalization. So I think the rather calm approach that you have uh, when you test the hypothesis is actually very well needed. Um, I'd like to go in a bit more on, on the topic of whether the market economy is bad for women or not. And I think the first general question that one must ask oneself is really when we say that something is good for women, what do we mean by that? Uh, it's not always self-evident. Uh, I think, in the, again, in the general debate, when we discuss gender equality, uh, gender equality, we discuss this in terms of two things, either in terms of empowerment, sort of compensating uh, for, for weaker rights historically and sometimes present, and of course, also the legal, the legal system, whether we are legally equal or whether the legal and the, whether the state is actually discriminating in its institutional framework. Um, my sort of starting point in that debate on whether 
uh, something is good or bad for women in a societal sense is whether women have agency. Do they have the same kind of agency that men do? I think that's the most important factor. Um, and then the question, of course, be what kind of economic system provides the most agency to women um, vis a vis men? And I think the, the quote that you showed from Anne Cole, where you said that capitalism is, uh, in, a, in a way, progressive, inherently progressive, that it's something that will counteract uh, pa patriarchal uh, and um, misogynic norms and tradition in itself, inherently. And I think that's, that's important to note here. Um, because then if you have a study that asks how is economic freedom related to the life satisfaction of women and men, um, then the question, of course, will be, uh, is the market economy providing women with agency or not? I would argue, yes. Um, but there is, of course, the sort of the issue of whether you have the material prospects uh, that are necessary <laughs> for you to, to exercise your freedom, <coughs> and then there are the norms, um, two different things. And we know for a fact that capitalism creates wealth. And I think you need to start from the sort of materialistic uh, base here. Uh, if you have wealth, wealth will produce choices. Nothing will deprive <laughs> someone of choices and agencies to the same extent as poverty does. So it has to, it needs to start there. Um, and if you have rising wealth, which capitalism obviously produce, um, women will inherently also get more choices of different kinds. And you can see that now in a lot of the debate that I think is also uh, making a lot of people very afraid, which has to do with the demography, mm. <laughs> is that when uh, the world becomes more affluent and especially poorer uh, parts of the world, women take on some of the fertility because they want to have more choice. Um, they want to enter the labor market, uh, they begin to claim equal legal rights. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it's, it's self-evident that the market economy will be better for women um, than vice versa. But then as Joanna points out, there are of course differences also to how uh, men and women uh, behave in environments of the kind that you will see being more pre um, prominent in, in the market economy. Um, and uh, I think it's true, even if some people find this very provocative, uh, that, that there are a gender difference here um, that will come into play. But then I think the boon again with the market economy is that it will also provide women not to enter those competitive advantages. And that takes me to the last point, uh, which is, I know also very provocative to some, um, but I think there is, there's been a debate now of whether there's a huge backlash uh, to feminism in the sense that there are now young women in Sweden saying that they you know, would rather like to be housewives or they would rather like to step out of the professional sphere that has been sort of the main argument for female empowerment. And you can see that as a huge backlash or you can see that as proof of the fact that we have now reached a level of affluence uh, where this can also be uh, one way of measuring agency, that women can both choose to have more options, but they can also willingly choose not to have them. Um, and the sort of the very basic for that is that you have enough material wealth, which is what our economic system will provide us with. Uh, so again, uh, lots of cause for concerns all over the world, no cause for panics. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much, Kari. Time to let Christian and Niklas respond, and I will ask you to be relatively brief in your responses so that we also have plenty of time for discussion. And please, we we'll, we'll let you start, Christian. All right. Let me just start by, by thanking all of you for, for these very careful and, and very thoughtful comments. Um, well, just just make two observations. One on Johanna's uh, idea about uh, uh, about global sexing and capitalism in general that that it creates more competition. I think that 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 is something that we probably should study quite a bit more because my 
my take on that is that what happens when you move from a less to a more capitalist society is that you simply move the forum of competition. So in, in a in a very capitalist, very economically free society, competition is market competition. That doesn't mean that if you, if you remove some of the market competition, you don't get competition. You just move it to politics, where, as I see it at least, competition is much less about merit and much less transparent. And the probably the, one of the problems in experiments is that in experiments you get more or less competition. Period. You don't move it to another forum. So. I think it, it, it's a com comment that is really worth thinking about because I'm not sure that uh, the experiments that you're, some people are running are are likely to pick up real-world effects in that sense. Um, the other one is 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 uh, on, on Kain's points. Um, Nicholas and I recently revised the paper on, on gender differences. Uh, I would have loved to have your comments uh, before we had revised it because the, I think you're exactly right that this is about women's agency. It's a very good way of, of, of putting it. Um, and let me just tell a, a family story before I, uh, we move on to, to Nicholas. So I grew up in Southern Denmark, which was German until 1920, between 1864 and 1920. Uh, 6,000 people down here died in World War I because they were pressed into German service, including parts of my family. So my two of my great-grandmothers actually started businesses themselves. One started a hotel, one ran the family glacier business, which was a rather large business. And both of them could do that in the 1920s because the region had gone back to Denmark, which was much more economically free they would have not been able to do that if it had remained German. So I think that's one of the nice stories and one of the stories that you could very easily tell from developing countries today about how economic freedom gives uh, women m many more opportunities and more agency. And perhaps we're just too not good enough in our research to tell those stories. Thanks. Thank you. So, please, Niklas. <clears throat> I agree with Christian. Great points by everyone in the panel. Um, well, one could talk for hours about uh, about them, of course, mm -hmm. but I have to limit myself to just a couple of brief points uh, so that we let you ask your questions as well in the audience. So, um, I think Johanna's point about competition is very interesting. And I think there are certainly such elements uh, to the market economy. Uh, I believe that women do behave differently often uh, under competition than men and may like competition less than men in many cases. However, I think, again, with our broad perspective in these studies, what we try to capture is sort of the net effects, uh, even though we do it, of course, imperfectly, all these measures are imperfect. But for instance, I think there's also a lot of cooperation in the market economy. There is competitive pressure, sure, but there is also a lot of cooperation. <laughs> Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you need to get a network together. You need a financer. You need perhaps a CEO in your company. Uh, you need relations with banks. Uh, you cooperate with uh, people who are integrated in a vertical chain, producing inputs to your products and so on. So when you face your competitors, before that, you cooperated a lot with people. You need the trust of others and you need yourself to be trustworthy to, to sort of start a business, become successful. And I think <coughs> there are both elements in the market economy. There is the sharp competition, but before that, and perhaps also during the competitive process, there is also a lot of cooperate, cooperation, which may foster this feeling and also build on this feeling of trust that we identify. So, yeah, it's a, it's a complex issue, but uh, maybe these sort of play out in different directions in terms of women's life satisfaction, but both could very well be present. Uh, on populism that Rika talked about, I think that's very interesting. And 
Christian and I have some uh, colleagues, uh, Andreas Berg and Anders Tjärne, who have studied the relation between both economic freedom and populism and globalization and populism, because that's another big debate. What they find is no relation between the degree of market economy or globalization and populism, uh, which is very interesting because many people, I think, suspect that globalization with its effects on perhaps closing down old industries, people become unhappy and they start disliking globalization. <coughs> uh, actually, that does not seem to be a very strong or dominant effect. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, that's an extra. And then lastly, I also mm -hmm. like Karin's idea of agency a lot. And I came to think when you discussed this choice by women, perhaps in the market economy to go back to an old <coughs> style, women's role, if you call it that sort of, oh, I want to be a housewife now again. Um, I thought of the economics Nobel Prize winner, James Buchanan, who has an argument about the market economy, which builds on private property rights. So if you own your sort of, well, you have perhaps a plot of land, you have your house, uh, some money and so on. This actually allows you to avoid the market process. Uh, you can choose if you want to, to not engage with other people in competition. You can be happy in, on your plot. Perhaps you become less rich uh, that way, possibly, but it's a choice you can actually make if you own things. So he calls that property as a guarantor of liberty. Um, property giving you actually the ability to choose even a non-market uh, lifestyle in a market economy in the wider sense. So I think that ties in a little bit to that idea. Anyway, that was my comments. Again, we could talk the whole day, I think, about all these points, <laughs> but uh, now we also want to see what the audience has to say. So calling, uh, yes, we will talk about this for, for 20 minutes here, and then, well, we can continue all day in different uh, ways. But uh, now we leave the, uh, open up for questions from the audience here. And again, unfortunately, we cannot allow questions from participants over Zoom. So I will allow you, uh, I will encourage you to present yourself before you ask your question. Also state who the question is for, if it's for Niklas and Christian or for either of the panelists. And also speak up clearly so that it's uh, possible for participants over Zoom to hear. So do we have any questions from the field? Well, uh, I, I'm an old uh, researcher from here. Um, I finished my research 47 years ago, so I'm probably off touch. But I have two issues. Uh, you have touched upon globalization contra, let's say, nationalization. That is the national, the big political issue, as I have understood now, is um, uh, nationalistic or globalistic. That's the big issue. And I would like to see a study that deals with the advantages of both principles and why there is a collision against these two ways of putting it, at, at looking at it. That, that's one thing. Um, the other big issue that I think this institute should address, and that would interest me very much, and that is a very difficult question of the inequality of Femming and for dealing. What's that called? The wealth distribution. Wealth distribution. We have, in, in a very well working capitalistic society, we have so extreme differences in wealth distribution, not income distribution, wealth distribution. 98% of the wealth in the world is owned by 2% of the, of the people and institutions. And that I think is a very, very big problem also for us who confess to capitalism. That's, that's my question. So do you want to address the question to Niklas, Christian, or maybe the panelists? Well, the, those were, is my general view, maybe that's out of the point, but I think that 
what has been said here about gender and capitalism is very, very intelligent and very, very wise. Can I just pitch in with the uh, uh, wealth distribution issue? I'm, I'm very sorry that you've been uh, captured by the Oxfam propaganda. Uh -huh. uh, because <laughs> the, the discussion in, in the last few years has been about wealth distribution and wealth inequality based on data from, I think, the UBS in Switzerland that measures something they call net wealth inequality. And that basically means that if you have a well-functioning financial system where young people are able to borrow money and buy an apartment or whatever, and old, older people can use their savings, you're going to have a much higher level of net wealth inequality because they measure it by savings minus debt. So the more you actually are able to redistribute wealth across your life, the worse does it look in that kind of, of statistic. In And uh, pensions that are in some way in a public pension system, even if they're individual, are not added to the wealth of individuals there. So it's an incredibly bad indicator of actual wealth inequality, which is it has this inbuilt feature that the better the institutions work that give people agency over the life course, the worse does it look. Do we have any comments or follow-ups on that? Uh, yeah, no, I have another comment, if it's okay, and that relates to something I find really interesting in this discussion on uh, on uh, globalization and uh, populism. I think, maybe like I said, there's no evidence, but at least I think, to be fair, there are a lot of studies show that there are effects, political effects of globalization. Whether that is populist or not, one can debate. But for instance, my former colleague in Lund, Kobe Mainesi, who's now in Monash, he has this very convincing study, I think, that shows that in the US, when there was an import shock from China, it really increased polarization, political polarization. Okay, so if you were Republican, you became a Tea Party Republican or, or Donald Trump uh, supporter. If you were a Democrat, you became a uh, Bernie Sanders type of uh, Democrat. So that's at least, is this populist? I'm not sure, but it's at least large political effects. There's also a study on the uh, UK showing the same thing, that the China effect, the globalization, uh, kind of led to the Brexit. Okay, is Brexit populist? Perhaps not, but it's a huge political effect, at least, that people in regions in UK that were hurt by imports from China you know, for, uh, for, uh, for Brexit. And that effect was actually much larger than the immigration effect, which was typically uh, focused upon in, in, the, in the public effect. Stephen Kierkegaard's comment is good, and I think it illustrates a little bit the previous debate, say, Johanna's comments vis-a-vis -vis our results, because uh, Andreas Berg and Anders Schane, they discuss this, these studies as well in their studies, and what they point out is that they try to use these broad measures of globalization, like the COF index, um, and readily acknowledge that there are incidents connected to the China shock especially. That has been studied because of methodological reasons, because you get the shock, a very peculiar particular event uh, for a few years that uh, struck against some countries. Yes, there you see these effects. But is that a general phenomenon? They think not. So they think the problem when you look at these very precise studies, while they are good in, in the scientific sense, they may mislead you uh, to think that that's a general phenomenon. So again, you have, there are always various things working in, in different directions in a, in a market economy, of course. Um, so the question is, what is the net effect of these? Things. And at least they conclude in their two studies on this that uh, the general pattern seems not, uh, they do measure it a little differently. Yes, polarization is slightly different. And so they look at uh, these populism indices 
produced by Anders Johansson Heine in Stockholm, actually, one of them and the other by The Guardian. So the measures are a little different. But uh, yeah, so it's more nuanced than I let, uh, that I admitted sort of in my previous comment, uh, Fred is right about these studies, but perhaps they hide also some countervailing effects um, that are perhaps better captured by these broader measures, uh, possibly. Yeah. Is it possible to treat women as one group? Because you could argue that you have those who benefit from globalization and you have the others who make this possible by cleaning the offices and the homes, by cooking the food, by taking care of children, old people, sick people, etc., who, in my view, don't benefit as much from globalization as the other group. Nicholas, can I take that one? Sure. Uh, there are two, two, two questions, the two answers to that. So first is that it's almost impossible in these kinds of studies to identify who are the winners or losers of globalization. So different countries have different comparative advantages, which means that it it's going to be different groups in, in different countries that materially benefit a lot from increased globalization. So we would have to have incredibly specific country-specific information in order to identify which groups we're talking about. And we don't have that information. I don't think anyone does. Uh, the second is that it's actually not true that uh, cleaners and, and bartenders or whoever it is but do not benefit from globalization. You're looking at the manufacturing side, but uh, I think it was six or seven years ago, there was a great paper in the QJE by two guys whose names I can't pronounce, um, where they looked at price effects of globalization. What they show is that globalization is really much better for the relatively poor than the relatively rich. Because what globalization does it is that it makes a lot of standard goods, including food, much cheaper. And that, that's actually one, one aspect of globalization that we tend to forget when we look at, at, at employment and manufacturing effects and so on, is that there's also a price effect that is hugely pro-poor from globalization. So in that sense, Globalization is actually more beneficial to the cleaner than the, to the CEO of the firm. Well, uh, I think one has to make a very big difference between the globalization in economic terms, and we call that division of labor, and that is that is good. I mean, we have proven that for for a long time now. Uh, but we also have the building up of institutions uh, that create a, let's say, a um, democratic problem because the distance from us, small people, to these institutions who have lots of power increases. So there we have a democratic problem. And that, that, there I think there could be some issues to deal with. Uh, so I think one has to nuance this thing. Uh, globalization is, I would say, definitely good in the division of labor sense, but not necessarily positive in the governance sense, that we create institutions that are very far away from the little man. That that's, I think you have to differ. and and. Why this issue is a bit acute is that we don't dif we don't differentiate between those two issues because everybody likes globalization in the economic sense, but not everybody likes the globalization in the institutional sense. I think. I think I will take the opportunity to yes. take up the question. Yes. So that we can also hear perhaps from the political representative and from the other panelists here. So because I have. I was also interested, you, you talk about capitalism and the market economy. So can we say that more on this is always better 
or is it the case that different combinations of the different building blocks is, you know, are there certain combinations of welfare state, market economy uh, with an open sector towards the, um, the, the outside world in competition uh, in the private sector that is better? And in, in that sense also, what is the role for politicians and for public policy? Um, so. I will direct this question first to Karin, but of course we will also let the other people respond and also respond to your original comment. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge question, but I think uh, if we take up sort of the populist strand, uh, I think uh, there is reason to believe that capitalism can foster sort of counter reactions, populist counter reactions in the sense that capitalism is very messy. And people don't like messiness <laughs> as a general rule, uh, especially uh, people on the left, uh, I, I find often have a very well-developed sense of order, sometimes overdeveloped in my uh, opinion. Um, but, but in general, people don't like insecurity. They like to know what's happening. And, and capitalism is not very good at providing the answers of what will come. Some of us like that, <laughs> but a lot of people don't. Uh, and there is um, there is very interesting research made by uh, a political psychologist uh, called Karen Stenner. I don't know if you've read her. She wrote a book called The Authoritarian Mind, where she plotted out sort of the different segments of the population are uh, sort of are, are more or less risk adverse and more or less prone to react negatively to, to messiness. But she also showed that the way that you phrase change actually has a big impact on how people react to it. So it's in a sense, it's, it's, it's a lot to do about wording, I think. So from the political <laughs> perspective, I, I find that very interesting. But if you, uh, if you discuss change as something that will, is for everyone and that will bring everyone along, uh, sort of the, the, the fear lessens, and you can actually avert some people that would rivet towards more authoritarian stance as a reaction uh, to the fear of change. Whereas if you are uh, very much in favor of extremely populist us and them uh, sort of rhetorics, you can trigger um, that reaction. So I think that's that's one way of looking at it. And then of course, I mean, it's, it's an eternal question of whether sort of there is a political task to um, provide say welfare systems or, or such that makes people confident enough to accept change uh, and to what extent that should be a big machine or a small machine. Uh, and I don't think that problem can ever be solved really. I and mean, that's, that's sort of the core basis for democracy is that we do have different views on that. Yeah. Oh, uh, Johanna, did you have any comments or? Thank, yes, thank you. Um, so let me again make uh, three brief points. So, so firstly, in, in international trade, we have discussed for a long time uh, the fact that there are winners and losers and that the gains that are generated from trade are substantial enough that there could, with appropriate redistribution, be only winners. But of course, in practice, that is not, that's not what we see and the same is true about globalization. Again, I'm a huge proponent of, uh, of both market economy, capitalism and, and globalization. So I certainly think that the benefits outweigh the loss. Um, but pretending that there are only winners is, is definitely not the way forward. And there I would echo what Karin is saying, that it's also about how you how you describe things. Um, but also how you how you do things uh, in practice and how you use various redistributive systems to actually get more people people on board. Um, brief comment to to uh, Christian's uh, remarks related to to um, competition and competitiveness. Um, I think the experimental literature is faring a little bit better uh, than uh, than what you are <laughs> alluding to. Um, we do study various types of competition, certainly not only the market uh, market economy type. Um, we do see, however, that that women uh, are especially uh, averse to the 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 market type competition, especially again when it's framed like that. And I'm not saying that because I think it's bad or I think we should have less of it. 
I think we should probably have have more of it. But it's something to be aware of, uh, and it's uh, something that we need to think about why we do have these gender gender differences in reactions to and propensity to choose into um, these types of competitions and how we can potentially potentially change that and make competition more um, equitable, if you will, not in terms of results, but in terms of uh, how you how you participate in it. Uh, my final point, again, related to to framing and uh, and to how things are are described. I think the agency, the sense of agency is something that is demanded by by people in general. There is a big literature on the importance of of, uh, of locus of control and how how you feel, um, whether you feel that you are in charge of your own life right. and whether you feel in control uh, over over important aspects of of your your everyday um, experiences, and there we should be aware that many people and uh, new new uh, surveys survey evidence from the U.S. show, for example, that that the majority of uh, of U.S. Uh, citizens feel that the economic system is rigged against them, that they don't have a chance, that they that they that they are not in control of their own economic uh, outcomes. We should be aware that this is a sense that many people have. It's probably not true that they have less control than they would have in an alternative uh, economic system, rather the opposite. But Again, if people are living with this perception uh, of what market economy and capitalism and globalization means for for them, and they perceive that they that they lack control and that they lack agency, that is in itself something that we should uh, we should try to address and see how can we how can we make sure that we are all aware of the fact that we do live in a system where you don't have perfect agency, but you most likely have much more agency than you would have in uh, in alternative systems how can we how can we promote that sense uh, both in terms of how we describe and, and frame things but also in time in terms of of lived experiences message from the panelists i take it that the uh, task for the non-populist politicians is really to explain make people feel safe in this globalized and competitive world and also find a an appropriate from what that is level of equalization of the playing field and perhaps redistribution. And we are almost out of time. So I will give Christian and Niklas then a chance to, to finish very with a brief comments. Christian perhaps. Well let, let me just finish by, by thanking you all and reminding you of one thing. Don't make the Nirvana fallacy. So we should always compare actual markets, actual capitalism, to the actual alternative. And the Nirvana fallacy is one that people make all the time. They compare actual markets to their ideal version of politics. Instead of saying, well, we, we need politicians to do this, to regulate this, then ask yourself, can you name one politician in real life that you would want that to do that. Very often, my students can never name a single politician when I ask them. Because that, when they are forced to do that, they realize that they've made the Nirvana fallacy. Maybe Cora knows at least one politician. Yes. That <laughs> she trusts. Um, yeah, I also just want to thank you all, the panel, uh, people here, and uh, people at Zoom who followed us, and Karin also for, for helping us along. Uh, as Christian said, in a way, uh, I think this is really enriching for a researcher to sort of present your work a little bit in um, in accessible fashion sometimes. You get really good feedback. And actually, it's almost that you regret that you didn't present it earlier uh, because there are actually things that you could incorporate in your way of arguing and thinking about the issues. And I think you have provided examples of that today. So thank you all. Thank you. Emma. Good night.